Thank you, Jeff. I think I'm on. I think I've, I've turned my device on, have I? No. Uh, yeah. Hello, yes? Yes, no. I flicked a switch, but... All way over. I think so. We'll take it off and have a look. You just talk amongst yourselves for a minute. <laughs> Today and it was great to have a warm welcome. <clears throat> Thank you, Nico, for at the door there giving us a welcome. Now that Nico's disappeared too, but he gave us a nice welcome at the door. I appreciate the worship from um, Wendy and Teresa and Larry there on the drums. Thank you to you guys. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> bring us into the presence of the Lord there. That was, uh, was precious. I bring you greetings, um, obviously from my wife Josie. Uh, but also from Pastor Carl and Jess and the community over there at Catalyst Church, which is just the same as you guys. Yes. It's just another expression of God's body, that's all it is. Yeah. Sometimes we look at big churches and small churches and we think there's something different going on, there's not. You come to any church and the first person you meet when you come in the door is Jesus, because he's there at every church. Amen? Amen. And uh, so it's, it's really great to be in this house of God today and uh, I don't miss Catalyst one bit this morning because I'm here with you and it's great to be in God's house wherever that is and uh, it was interesting Steve bringing communion today because I don't think Steve knew where I was going to head with the word today but I'm just going to be talking about faith through the storms Amen. so there you go Steve I'm glad you left me a bit of message there to preach <laughs> thank you for that but uh, it, is, uh, it is good to be, to be sharing in line with that. I think we've got, have we got the, uh, yes. we have Faith Through the Storms, it's up there. Yes. Ready to go, praise God. And uh, we all know about the importance of faith in our lives, don't we? The, the Bible even says, without faith, it's impossible to please God. So the bar is pretty high there right away, isn't it? That we've got to be people of faith if we are going to be people of God. That faith is just... Is just key. But how many also know that as important as faith is, there is also the absolute certainty that our faith is going to be tested. Am I the only one here today, or has anyone else here had their faith tested? Anyone? There's at least one or two of us. Great. I'm sure that we all at times have had our faith tested. On Sunday the 27th of September 2009, so around 10 years ago, Josie and I were in the USA visiting our family. Our son lives over there with uh, his wife and four of our grandsons. And uh, we, when we go to visit them, we also join with them at their church, which is Reality Santa Barbara. And uh, Pastor Britt Merrick, the senior pastor, got up to speak and he's clearly doing so with a heavy heart. And he told us that on the previous Monday, on the previous Monday, um, they had been called to school because five-year-old Daisy Love there was involved in a fall. And when she was taken to the doctors, they discovered that there was a cancerous tumour the size of a grapefruit in that little girl's tummy. And uh, he told us that the outlook in the natural was not good. So it happened on the Monday and we were there on the Sunday. You can sort of imagine the, the of the church, can't you? And Britt said that he and Kate, his wife, had sat in the hospital room and cried. Uh, and he told us that he said this to God. And I'm quoting him. God, I ask you to heal my daughter. We love her and don't want to lose her. Please heal her. But I tell you this, God, if she is not healed, if we lose her from us, then I promise you this. What are we going to say to God? Never. This is what he said. It will not change anything between you and me. 
What a test of faith. And what a response. Let's pray. Father God, we, we just uh, come before you today as a, as a people of God. And Lord, we cannot pray to be, to be spared testing. But what we can pray is in the midst of all of our testing, we will find you. We pray this in Jesus' name as we open your word. Amen. 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 Today's scripture is um, Mark chapter 4 and verse 36 to 41, 35 to 41. And uh, to read that for you and with you. That day when evening came, he, that is Jesus, said to his disciples, let us go over to the other side. Leaving the crowd behind, they took him along, just as he was in the boat. There were also other boats with him. A furious squall came up, and the waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. The disciples woke him and said to him, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? He got up, rebuked the wind, and said to the waves, Quiet, be still. Then the wind died down, and it was completely calm. He said to his disciples, Why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? They were terrified and asked each other, Who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. Amen. Well, what's happening here? What's happening here? You see on the on the slide there is um, Rembrandt's painting of the storm on the Sea of Galilee, painted in 1633. Very famous painting. By the way, if you get a chance to see that painting, please let me know because it was stolen in. 1990, I think, and it still remains stolen, stolen from a museum along with about 11 other paintings. There's a huge reward for it. So if you see it hanging in, you know, past Jeff's lounge room or something, <laughs> please let me know. We're leading to repentance, and we'll go and collect the reward together. <laughs> Pretty good. But anyway, there's also an interesting painting, because if you count up the people in the painting, it's actually Jesus and 13 disciples. So Rembrandt got it wrong, no. He's actually painted himself in the picture. <laughs> He's actually the guy in the, the green looking out of this. That's Rembrandt's self-portrait in the storm on the Sea of Galilee. So what's going on here? A huge storm comes up on the lake. The, the uh, Sea of Galilee or the Lake of Gennesaret is a shallow lake, it's about 21 kilometres long, it's about 13 k's wide, and it's often subject to these high winds that blow through the valleys that surround the lake. And they can produce waves up to 8 metres high, which is pretty significant. Most, if there's any surfers here, they're pretty happy to surf 8 metre waves, but this was, this, they, these guys weren't surfing, they were out in a boat, and this storm erupts, and let's remember there was at least four professional fishermen in this boat. Four professional fishermen. Andrew, James, John and, and Simon Peter were all professional fishermen. And I did a bit of a calculation how many times these guys had probably been out fishing. And conservatively, I came out that they'd probably done about 5,000 fishing trips in their time. Because they'd been fishing since they were boys. They've probably done 5,000 fishing trips. And I reckon they would have seen storms before, right? They would have been out there and seen storms before. But this was obviously a doozy because they were terrified. The professionals were terrified. And where is Jesus? He's asleep in the boat. We'll talk more about that later. Mark calls the lake, when he writes this account, he calls the lake a sea. He uses the word thalassa. Now, Jeff might give me the better interpretation of that. By the way, have you ever been onto your website and seen 
all of the teaching that Pastor Jeff has got there. You don't have to go to Bible college in this church. You just if you went through one of those teachings a week, you'd probably have better schooling in the Word than you would if you went to many of the Bible colleges in our country. But, uh, true, nonetheless. A great, I'm serious, there's a great depth of teaching there for you if you were going to take one of those as a study once a week and once every two weeks. You, you do well. You do well. But Mark calls this, calls this lake a sea. He could have used the word lake, which is limni. could have used that word, but he deliberately doesn't. And I believe that was the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Because in using the word to see, he then evokes in the minds of his hearers some very clear pictures and concepts. An angry sea represents chaos and trouble. And uh, God in the past had delivered Israel from the troubles of slavery through his control over what? The sea. The sea. The Old Testament's full of references to God's control over the sea. In um, I get that scripture. Okay. Psalm 66, 65, and verse 7 uh, talks of God silencing the roaring of the seas. God, our Saviour, who stilled the roaring of the seas, the roaring of the waves. Psalm 107 says this: Then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble. And he brought them out of their distress. He stilled the storm to whisper. The waves of the sea were hushed. They were glad when it grew calm. And he guided them to their desired haven. When they read this account from Mark, these good Jewish girls and boys who were hearing this, their minds would straight go back to Psalm 107 because they knew it. Because they didn't have cell phones and things to cause their brains to shrivel up. They actually could remember huge portions of the Bible, whole books. Just little boys and girls can remember whole books. They had, they had a better brain wiring than we have today. It's not our fault. We've grown up in a different generation. But they could remember great portions of Scripture. And as Mark gives this, they would have thought, well, Psalm 107. They didn't, of course, because there weren't any numbers on them. But <laughs> their mind would have gone straight back to that account. God is the one who stills the storm. And it was well accepted by the hearers. It probably is well accepted by us as well that who can control the storm? Only God. Who has control over the sea? Who's that uh, multi-millionaire these days who is doing all the uh, factory stuff? And is it milk or milk? What's his name? That guy. He's got billions of dollars, but with all this technology that he's developed and all anyone else has, has anyone ever been able to control the sea? Will they ever be able to do it? No. Because there's only one person who controls the sea, and that is God. And uh, so in the midst of this angry sea, Jesus is asleep, and even that evokes scripture too, it doesn't. Uh, Psalm 4 8, in peace. I will lie down and sleep, for you alone, Lord, make me dwell in safety. It's even possible that the hearers thought about Jonah and God's control over the sea in that episode. They both witnessed God's control over the sea. The key difference is to those stories is Jonah was running away in disobedience. Jesus was in the perfect will of God. And Jonah was subject to the storm. That God had dominion over it. Now Jesus shows that same dominion. And the hearers of Mark's gospel said, Well, who does this but God? Who does this but God? Then there's an interesting twist in the tale um, where Jesus says to the disciples, Why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? Now, this is a pretty scary experience. So why does Jesus, why is Jesus so tough on them? This is a legitimately scary experience. Even the toughest of us guys here would admit that if we're in a little boat in the midst of eight metre waves, a lot of our macho bravo-ness would go away. We'd be going, Ooh, please help me, God. It's pretty scary. But Jesus rebukes them. 
And uh, I think part of the answer may be that the disciples had been exposed already to great examples of Jesus' power. They'd seen it. They witnessed his authority over demons, over sickness, and they'd heard his teaching. Yet they were still afraid, and yet they still lacked faith. But I would ask the question, are we so different? Are we so different? We can mentally assent to Jesus' power and of his authority and still fall victim to fear. Even having seen God move in the past in our lives, as probably many of us here have seen God's mighty moves in our life, maybe it was a healing, maybe it was a provision. We've seen God move in the past, and yet a new circumstance comes, a new storm rises, and fear overtakes us. So even as followers of Jesus, our fear of going under can be greater than our confidence in the presence of Jesus, in his love, in his keeping power. We look around, around us today and there's a lot of darkness to look around at in our world. And if we're not careful, that's all we will focus on. That's all that we will see is the darkness. And truth is, there is a lot of darkness around us. But can I encourage you by, by saying something you already know, is that the full light of God's eternal day is coming. Amen. The full light of God's eternal day is coming. When all those things that can, can come upon us and grab us and hold us in fear, they will not even be a memory. They won't even be a memory. But there is stuff around us. But even in this light, even in this this, uh, this night time of of history, we we can see that God is still here. God is still active, and we can choose. We can continue to live in a world of fear and chaos, seeing ourselves alone and cut off from God, or we don't have to. We can open ourselves up to the promise of Jesus who said that the kingdom of God is not just afar off, but right now it is in our midst. Jesus said the kingdom of God is here now. Right where as we sit here today, as we prayed earlier for, for Ross and for others, the kingdom of God is here now. Yes. It's afar off, it's here now. So it's that, it's that tension of the now and the not yet. The not yet is the full glory of that day. But there is a now where God is active. Where God is still moving. And that's what we want to have be grounded in. Not the fear of what is around us. Because life will have its storms. There's no doubt about it. Life will have its storms. There's no denying it. Pain and fear and loss are sometimes our experience. Who has lost a loved one in the last 10 years? Who has lost a loved one in the last 10 years? Nearly half of us here have lost a loved one. And some of those losses would have been, if we call it, before their time. That they didn't die in old age, as is our privilege one day. It would be our privilege to die in old age if we come to that. That many of those hands raised, that was not the case. It was an early death. It was an untimely death. And that's sometimes our experience. And we're not immune to life because we're followers of Jesus. I'll say that again. We are not immune to life because we're followers of Jesus. Pastor Britt and Kate and Daisy Love were not immune and neither are we. So where is Jesus? Well, he's right there in the storm. He's right there in the storm. And does he care? Is the word of song. Does he care? Well, I would say he cares more than we know. More than we can even understand. But some people ask and say, well, well why is there trouble at all? Why is there trouble? Why are there storms? And that the answer to that, we've really got to go back to the beginning of humanity itself. Because God did bless us with a perfect world. With no sickness, no pain, no suffering, no death. But then mankind 
disobeyed and sin entered and the inevitable fruit of sin followed. Pain, suffering, illness, violence, death. And it didn't take you many long to manifest that, did it? It didn't take the episode Cain and Abel long to come about as sin entered humanity. And that is inescapably the lot of this present world. And if you're hearing that as a negative, I hope you're not, it's reality. It's reality. But there's a greater reality, and that's in the hands of God. Hallelujah. Praise God, he didn't leave us there. He didn't leave us in that, that place of uh, fallenness. But in love and grace and mercy, he then enacts his divine rescue plan. He sends Jesus, his son, into the world, fully man and fully God. He lives a perfect life and then he dies in our place. He suffers our separation in time so we will not have to suffer that separation in eternity. Hallelujah. That's worth an amen. amen. You might have read this scripture before. Let's read it again. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son that whoever believes in him, places his trust in him, his faith, shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned. But whoever does not believe has made a choice. They stand condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. So yes, we, we see storms in life. There's no doubt about it. But no matter what happens, we can shelter in our faith rather than be swamped by our fears. We can shelter in our faith rather than be swamped by our fears. Now God can change circumstances. And sometimes He does. It's true. God can change circumstances. But even when the bad stuff is happening, God is still there. And if we're open to Him, He'll continue to speak to our hearts. And can I tell you this morning, never forget, if you just remember one thing today, never forget that if we truly know Him as Saviour, then the final storm has already been still. The destructive storm of sin and its penalty is still for you. Completely and utterly and eternally still. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The most significant storm that any of us have to consider when it comes to this earthly life, if you know Jesus, the storm's been still. The, the reality of sin, the penalty of sin, has been still. Let me just quickly talk about the illusion of control. Do you recognise that lady? <laughs> control is one of the most de deceptive concepts there is. In the West, in particular, we go along life's course and we are pretty much insulated to a large degree by our wealth. And yes, if you're here in Australia today, you're wealthy. Trust me. I've lived, I've lived for a number of years in Haiti. Trust me. You are wealthy. You are amongst, the people sitting in this room are in the top about 15% of wealth in the world. Top 15%. Every one of you sitting here. So I don't have a job, Pastor. Sorry. The very fact you live in Australia places you in the top 15% of the world's wealth. So enjoy it. Right. You're doing well. We're insulated by that wealth and our standard of living by our social and civic order. Today in Haiti, they're in turmoil. They're burning ties in the street. There's people running here and there. You can't dare take your car out because you may end up dead. Anyone felt that today as they drove to church? Oh God, I'm going to go to church today. None of us felt that because we are insulated by this wonderful social order that we live in, that we complain about so often. I couldn't get to the doctors when I wanted to. You get to go to the doctor! Hallelujah, wow! 
Try being in a hospital situation where you must bring your own sheets, your own food, buy your own medicine. There's a doctor there, but that's it. There's a hard bed and your family have to provide all the bedding and all the food. Am I exaggerating, Josie? And we sometimes complain about our medical care. John, let up on us, please. <laughs> We feel for the most part, because we live in Australia, we feel for the most part that we are under control. We are under control. And it's true, to a large degree, we're insulated, we can feel that way. But, even in our largely controlled environment, the storm can break upon us. We can have a job loss, and we can have an illness and a betrayal, or a bereavement. And I'm not minimising the pain that we suffer here in Australia because others have it worse in the world. Please hear me, I'm not minimising our pain. Whatever you go through is what you most intensely feel. I accept that, I know that. I've had plenty of pain in my life and it doesn't always help me to think, oh, someone in Haiti is worse off. I get that. But still, sometimes it's good for us to get an overarching perspective of how blessed we are. Because we are blessed. But even so, these things can come and we felt we were in control, but now we feel we're charging downhill with, the, with no brakes. And some of you here have felt that. Some of you may be feeling that today. Some of you may be feeling that today. And like the disciples in the boat, we can focus wholly on the storm and be afraid, or we can place our faith in Jesus. And the problem with fear Tell you what the problem with fear is. All fear can ever do for you is make you more afraid. That's it. It's all it can do for you. Fear can only make you more afraid. Can't bring you any relief. Can't bring you any peace. Certainly can't bring you any joy. And it, and it makes us withdraw from life. So we sort of lose out on all the big things that God wants to be in. Alright, quickly. Let's just uh, look at some faith lessons from this storm. A faith lesson from the storm. Firstly, you can be close to Jesus and still encounter the storms. 1 Peter 4, 12 to 16 says, Dear friends, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal that has come on you to test you. He's talking to believers. As though something strange were happening to you. However, if you suffer as a Christian, do not be ashamed, but praise God that you bear that name. So you can be close to Jesus and still suffer storms. So don't have a guilt trip come upon you. Say, oh, I lost my job. How have I sinned? I've got illness. How have I sinned? Your, your uh, storm is probably not a direct consequence of your nearness or farthness from Jesus. It's probably not. It's probably got nothing to do with it. Now, if you go and rob a bank and you end up in jail, that storm is a direct consequence of your naughty behaviour. Okay, so you'll have to own that one. But if you have an illness come upon you, please don't buy into any concept that somehow you've uh, that's happened to you because you've disappointed God. Is that the God you worship? No. Is that the Jesus you know? He's just sitting up there waiting. Well, when he took a phone call outside. Well, I'm going to get her. Is that... Is that... And I'm sure she had to or she wouldn't have gone away. But she's probably delivering a baby or something. Man, just, hey, you're going to go and raise up and deliver a baby. Um, but please don't buy into that. And some people I hear scriptures get misquoted. Oh, Job said, the thing that I fear has come upon me. Yeah, Job said that. God doesn't say, yeah, that's right, Job. That's why it all happened, because you're fearful. I've heard sermons preached on that. That is a misuse of scripture. That is a man saying, this is what I'm feeling. God didn't give it a tick in the box and say, yeah, that's what happened. You were fearful, Job, of losing your kids, so I thought I'd wipe them out. Does that sound like God to you? Does that sound like the Jesus you know? So you can be close to Jesus. You can be loving Jesus with all your heart and you can still have Brit and Kate and Daisy loves the 
experience. Because I can assure you, Pastor Britt and his wife are close to Jesus. God didn't come after him because of any reason. We live in a fallen world. And part of that fall is our DNA is being messed up by, you know, radiation, all kinds of stuff. And some of us will get sick. But it's not because you don't know Jesus. Okay? So please take that burden off your shoulders. If you're carrying that, please take that. <coughs> Secondly, <coughs> Jesus permits these storms to test us. 1 Peter 1, 6 to 7 says, In all this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief and all kinds of trials. These have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith, of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may result in praise, glory and honour when Jesus Christ is revealed. Jesus permits. There's a difference between permits and causes. There's a big difference between permits and causes. But Jesus definitely permits the storms in life. Whose idea was it to go to the other side of the lake? Jesus. <coughs> Who knew the storm was going to happen? Jesus. Okay. So God does permit things in our life. But don't confuse that with God causes that thing to come about in your life. Because if he's looking out for you and saying, right, Steve, but he certainly permits things. Storms can press us to cry out to Jesus. And it's not a bad thing to find ourselves crying out to God, even out of desperation. But the answer to our question, don't you care, God, the answer is always yes, 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 he really does. 1 Peter 5, 7 says, Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Now, it's not stated in the text, but a lot, of, a lot of Bible scholars believe that the one who is quoted in, uh, in Mark there, teach you don't you care if we drown, was Peter. Now, I say it's not stated there, but it makes a lot of sense. Who was always opening their mouth first? Peter. Okay. He was the talkative one. And now, decades later, as he pens this epistle, it's hardly surprising that he'd be, he'd be drawing on the lessons of faith that he had in that little boat and in many other circumstances. By this time in his life, decades later, he'd gone through many trials of his faith. And he's able to say to us, cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. The next thing we can learn from this storm is Jesus will calm your storm or he will calm you. There were two storms raging that night. One was a meteorological storm and one was a personal storm, an internal storm that the disciples were feeling in their hearts. Now in this case, Jesus did calm the outward storm. He did calm the sea. He calmed the external storm. But sometimes the storm continues. And Jesus speaks to our troubled hearts. Rather than a storm, he speaks to our hearts. Peace be still. Peace be still. And the trust that follows produces what Philippians 4, 7 calls a peace, a peace of God which transcends all understanding. So, what happened? What happened with a storm that came on Pastor Britt and his family? Well, on Saturday the 16th of February 2013, after numerous battles and surgeries, little victories along the way, after every effort had been made medically and in prayer, eight and a half year old Daisy passed away painlessly in her sleep. And I read Britt and Kate's blog about that. And this is what they wrote in the blog in the days after. Jesus said to her, to Daisy, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live, even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? 
and they keep writing. Daisy believed this, and so do we. More than ever. End of quote. I call that peace that passes understanding. Do you? I do. I call that peace that passes understanding. I don't ever want to go through that horrible experience they went through. But I'd like to hope that if I had to, that I'd receive a similar peace from God. Number five, if Jesus is in your boat, or more correctly, if you're in his, then you will make it through the storm. <coughs> Isaiah 43, 2-7 in the Message Bible says, Don't be afraid, I've redeemed you. I've called your name, you're mine. When you're in over your head, I'll be there with you. When you're in rough waters, you will not go down. When you're between a rock and a hard place, it won't be a dead end. Because I am God, your personal God, the Holy of Israel, your Saviour. I paid a huge price for you. That's how much you mean to me. That's how much I love you. So don't be afraid. I am with you. We all know the story of the Titanic. In April 15, 1912, the ship that God himself could not sink, because that's what they wrote in the newspaper, God himself could not sink the Titanic. It struck an iceberg in the Atlantic Ocean, and in less than three hours, it was resting on the bottom of the Atlantic with the loss of 1,503 lives. That's what happened. What you may not know is that Titanic was built in Belfast in Northern Ireland. The ship sank on a Monday and on Sunday a grieving congregation gathered at Derry Presbyterian Church. Every heart in that service, gathering like we gather today, was focused on the 16 men from the area who had been engineered.